This is my second time giving a talk here. It's very exciting to see you all here. And this, this talk is mainly prepared by my students. So in turn, talking about deployment, we are actually using students to actually produce content for the future. So also, uh, uh, we also have a new collaborator, uh, Mushak Atabi. He's actually the Dean of Engineering at uh, Taylor's University in Malaysia. He's a very effective implementer for CBM in engineering systems in general. The whole uh, engineering department is completely running using some kind of CBM on pedagogical uh, approaches. Okay, so this is the thing that I think is very exciting for how we're gonna deploy CBM in the future. The National Academy of Engineering in the United States claim that there are 14 grand challenges. Amongst them are future fusion, fusion energy, making nitrogen cycles you know, more effective, and et cetera. And number 13 of the 14 grand challenges is advanced personal, personalized learning. But as we all know, personalized learning, as the way we understand it today, is basically using some computer-based math uh, websites or some math tools. How could that possibly be a grand challenge? So let's see it in a different vein. Uh, recently, I was challenged by the Ministry of Education's largest uh, arm of publication called Higher Education Press. They are also running the so-called uh, online courses for 20,000 different professors of the nation. As you can imagine, this is basically an online course uh, very similar to the ones you see on Coursera, on um, on uh, uh, MIT's open courseware. However, even though the government um, puts in billions of RMB a year into this thing, relatively fewer people has been downloading this content. So what can we possibly do to really make a common deployment strategy that will make all 20,000 courses of different kinds, not only being continually produced and become better, and most, most importantly, start being consumed, and actually get students to become better learners and actually become productive citizens. So instead of right away answering this question, my first question to myself is, what is really a university? As an engineer, I try to think of engineer, uh, the university as a system. So basically, a system has some input, which are the professors, content, pe people, and most important students, obviously. What do they really get output out of the system? It shouldn't be degrees. It shouldn't be certifications. It should be publishable content, usable services, re replicable services, obviously products. And these products should ultimately change the way we learn at university as well. So if we were thinking university as systems, then the first thing is, what has not been already been done online today? So Coursera, Khan Academy, they all claim they are replacing all the main functions of a university, especially in the lecture style, like the, the, thing, the, the thing I'm doing right now. If you just need to do this content, you almost can just do this just on YouTube. You don't really need to attend a university. So this is a major challenge for physical universities. So schools around the world are trying to tout very attractive programs so you can have designer mentor mentorship program, meaning that you can really find the best you know, uh, people that you like to become your mentors. These kind of things, we're trying to build satellite campuses around the world. And these kind of br brick and mortar approaches, they are actually still having their possible roles. So to try to become a useful role, uh, uh, player in the world, Tsinghua University also tried to build a next generation program hoping to become a leader in this field. So I was again challenged to actually trying to design this program. So instead of just having random number of programs, we, we are trying to combine engineering management, law studies, a health system, basically medical school, with business school and international relationship all together. Can we possibly create a new kind of school that truly combine different kind of experiences together and ultimately create a new learning experience? So instead of thinking about these programs as separate entities, talking about computer-based mass education, it's actually really thinking about what universities today should be offering that in the past, no other programs in the past could have. One thing we are trying to offer to all students around the world 
is actually, in this program, including to the track of students who does international relationships, we want to explicitly give them very intensive courses on giving the skills to perform scientific data management. And obviously other tools, as, as I listed down there, obviously most of them are, are free, and Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Research is the main sponsor of this. How many of you know and use this GitHub? Please raise your hand. Wow, quite a few, amazing, good. So for places I, I get talked to, usually don't, nobody raises their hand, nobody heard of it. So exactly, in the modern society, new tools like this, they are free, they are powerful, and they should become a generic instrument that we use every day. So it turns out, having these generic ideas is not sufficient. It turns out, motivating people to learn is ultimately the biggest challenge of all. We have the money to build bigger schools, we have the people who actually uh, appears to be learning, but most importantly, how can we do this? And obviously, Luke yesterday gave a great talk about how to do gamification, so I'm not gonna talk about it today. So it turns out the real challenge is really showing result within a short amount of time. What do, why do we need to do a result in a short amount of time? Because we want to engage students quickly, realize that they are here not just to here to learn math. They are not here just to learn something about uh, international relations. It's actually learning that they can quickly put together things of any kind into some larger scale of awareness and knowing that everything they do has meaning. I think that's truly the meaning of university. So instead of just thinking about teaching them how to use Mathematica, using, teaching them how to use PowerPoint to become better speakers, I think ideally we should try to get them to learn all these things in probably, ideally, the first months of their time at university and see if we can do that. So instead of starting from scratch, I actually had some help from Wolfram Research. Two years ago, I helped run the 10th uh, International Mathematics Symposium in China. To kind of put a sugar coat on top of this, I decided to call this the Math-Based Computer Education Conference. So actually flipping around computer and math together. Because instead of talking about teaching people how to use computer and to learn math, I think it's actually teaching people to use math mathematical thinking to actually use computer technologies. That would be probably a better way of thinking about this. So then this is what happened. Uh, I had a few students who decided to, to, to basically say, Ben, I want to build a solar model system that's controlled by Mathematica using real data, and we want to do this you know, completely controlled by Arduino, at least a single board computer system. I said, that's fine. OK, go ahead, do it. A month later, they came back to me. They actually have to travel three hours in tr public transportation to come to my office. And they said this to me. Well, sir, what can we do? I said, after a month, what have you done? They said, well, we haven't done anything. And so I said, what, what kind of question you have? We haven't thought about any questions. And what are you doing in the three hours you know, on the public transportation? Nothing. So I said, well, fine. Next time you come to me, please prepare your question, and at least we'll do something. The second time, a week, month, uh, months later, they came to me, still nothing. And I said, well, forget about math, computer, all these other things. The fundamental issue is that with all these opportunities, you'll be speaking and presenting in front of world-renowned mathematicians and Mathematica uh, creators, but you are wasting your opportunity. You are wasting my time, and please don't do this ever again. So please leave my office. I don't ever want to see you again. <laughs> so 10 days later, they call me on my cell phone. Say, sir, can I see you tomorrow in the morning? I said, well, with your performance, I'd rather not to see you. But they said, we have results. I was, I was thinking, how can you, people like you possibly have any result? <laughs> right? You don't have any mathematical skills. You cannot even con con construct a question. You don't know how, how to read Mathematica manual because your English is very bad. How can you possibly show something? So this is what happened. Okay. So this is a college student. Okay. Oh, by the way, all the videos are made by Woody Wong. Uh, so, so this is what happened, right? They came to my office. This is actually what I taped in the office. 
And they actually got three of these you know, planets moving around and controlled by Arduino, actually synced up with Mathematica data. I was completely dumbfounded. I said, what did you do? Just a sec, I'll, I'll just stop it for now. They said, well, we, we just learned it up by ourselves. I said, including you know, single computer programming in the last 10 days and, and learning Mathematica, and all these things, what happened to you? What did you eat in the last 10 days? They said, well, we, we got this you know, electronic dictionary, so we just move our cursor around these English words, and it just shows some Chinese words next to it. We just keep guessing, and we figure out how to do this thing. I said, wow, this is really computer-based learning in general, right? So then I said, well, that's not good enough, right? You are going to present in front of a, a, a bunch of really, really bright mathematicians and computer scientists. So in order to show that you really understand this, I want you immediately in the afternoon explain what you have done to a bunch of kids. Okay, so this is what happened. They actually start talking to a bunch of kids, and then I immediately put them into teams. So distributedly, they are actually talking with different students, one by one, and then these kids, like uh, seven to nine-year-olds, they started to actually use the language they learned from this college student and explain back to me, and also, obviously, their parents are around watching, right? So then their parents are very, very amazed. Well, how could these kids in an afternoon know anything about single board computer, you know, uh, gyroscope system, blah, 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 all these very strange words that they never heard their uh, kids utter? And as you can see, that this is finally what they, they did on, on campus. Actually, it's a 400 people auditorium. It's very uh, stressful, you know, like actually much bigger than here. So what's happening is that within 10 days, completely by students on their own personal initiative, they learned to start playing with the components, and then they started to think about and redefining what these components can do for them, and created these functionalities of these, you know, uh, solar system. And then they have to actually not only talk about these facts by themselves, but most importantly, become effective speakers to tell a big story. And most importantly, their parents are watching. So this one afternoon gave me a huge inspiration. I realized this is a total ecological system for learning. We can actually have a school with college students teach actually bad and not so effective college students, become effective and responsible people teaching kids, because young kids forces them, these people, to be responsible individuals. At the same time, we can actually get parents involved and right away get parents to know what they can actually help in the whole system. So, so I started talking around to some other supposedly powerful, influential people in China. This is the best uh, business school in China. So, so they said, well, why don't you try to create a program for top credited you know, programs like MBA programs and teach some of our MBA students or something? I said, that's a pretty good idea. But can I actually get credits, get real programs and issued around you know, uh, with, with real, real degrees? I said, why not? So basically, they said, well, we'll give you a program to start out with, a brand new program at Tsinghua University, and we'll give you 74 students, MBA executive type students, and you have to design a challenge to put, make them realize those four layers of uh, abstractions in, in four days. Well, I said, what do I have to start with? Well, they said, well, you, you, have, you have a little budget, but uh, you basically you have to design everything on your own. So I'm a busy professor, I don't have much time to think about this. So I get an undergraduate student who attended IMS 2010 to come back to China for summer vacation. I said, now you get a chance to torture people about your father's age to be able to work for four day long, you know, continuously without sleep. So he got very excited. So I, I'm willing to take on this challenge. So in order to guarantee success, he actually created three consecutive programs before uh, August 22nd. So anyway, the first, the first few challenges, we actually tried to get people with zero experience to assemble a 3D printer in three days and create a business plan with a production system, everything, in three days. And then after running it for three times, we found it's too easy. So we actually decided to change the game. So this is what happened. So instead of just using the 3D printer, we decided not only to have them use the 3D printer, build a 3D printer, Actually, we decided to have them build a, a fully automated uh, supply chain system in three days, and also 
So three printer is being pushed to them within 15 days, 15 minutes. They have to actually come up with logo design and learn new uh, software to create these logos. And then within 72 hours, they have to actually show us the ability to manage a bunch of completely strangers into productive teams using time management skills. And then this is the first night, right? So they actually learn to program. These people are MBA types. Many of them don't have any technical skills. So they have to learn Arduino programming from scratch. So this is what happened earlier. So day two, so they start doing some business process. This is uh, the dean of uh, international relations department. So he proposed to have somebody coming from his department to be our students too. So then the foundation, Xinhua Foundation people got interested. They said, maybe we should come really witness. Can you really push these people to get something done? Can this MBA type student really physically build something, make something useful? This is something never seen before. Oh, by the way, they also have to learn how to do video editing. This video mostly was done by then, but we obviously changed it to, to change the text so that we can have English titles. But this video pretty much was also learned during that time. So all these 74 people actually have to do this as well. So this happens to be the chairman for the MBA Student Association. So he was actually training the other MBAs that incoming. So he was completely shocked. I mean, after four days of orientation program, you actually get these people to actually build a real system, have a real business proposal, and sell the business idea to this, this person. So I thought maybe this is just a, a simple thing, meaning that we just did it for three days, three, four days. Can we actually push it out to be a continuous program? So I was, my, my university basically sent me out to Cambridge University in June 16th. So this is a picture I took at that time. It was a beautiful campus. But this, is, this campus probably is there for hundreds of years. I cannot possibly visually see any inclination of this is computer-based or ICT-based campus. However, it's still very beautiful. So then I took the picture and took it back to my students. Given this beautiful picture, can you imagine what kind of ICT infrastructure you could put behind this beautiful campus? And hopefully this campus is everywhere, ideally, the beautiful scene will be actually on our campus, and you'll be physically building this with this uh, technologies, you know, in, inside this house. So, so basically, within two weeks, this is a proposal for my students. This is a bunch of undergrad students, about 60 of them. So they decided to use GitHub as a way to manage their distributed content, and then they want to use social learning websites to basically communicate across different teams, and they actually invited a, a, a very uh, seasoned uh, project management expert to actually help them build a website that tracks all the activities for learning for every single student. And this is the proposed uh, infrastructure that they did. So literally within two weeks, a bunch of students physically got all these different parts running and actually started to, to use it as a service between our students and ultimately start serving the database classes I'm teaching right now. So. This is a new design after a few weeks. So as, as of now, this, the class is still taking place. So it's decided to switch GitHub because it's totally centralized in the United States. And it's extremely slow in China. So they decided to move it over to GitLab, uh, GitLab so that we can actually run the services locally in China. And then we can eventually build an infrastructure. Every single school can have their own personal, personalized or customized GitLab. And then we, we want to have all these other systems become an open source system and push it out to the whole country for other universities to use. So put it simply, to design a university should be a task for every single student enrolled in our campus. Because they have to anyway design their own four year or three year uh, programs anyway. So roughly this is what the students should go through in each cycle. Ideally, we should have designer colleges, meaning that every single university should be personally designed for each individual student. But how could that be possible? So instead of thinking about building very large, beautiful, you know, residential colleges like the picture I showed you, maybe we should have students or people like us thinking about designing small, mini residential colleges, almost like fraternity houses. And then these fraternity houses has a planning cycle, 
as an application cycle, as a filtering cycle. And obviously, once you are in, in, uh, enrolled in this program, and you can start doing all these other things, enjoy the learning experience. So roughly, this is the five cycles and nine elements I proposed to my university. And then they are actually thinking of taking this idea and actually write a 100-year plan, thinking about how this idea could actually become the generic abstract model that can run all universities, or specifically in China, that we will be thinking about this kind of personalized learning and personalized universities, at least starting with China, hopefully throughout the world in the future. So due to the extreme enthusiasm among students, this enthusiasm mostly comes from students, so that the, the, the teachers, the university administrators in our school got really, really you know, frustrated. They said, how come these stu students are working day and night in the office and trying to do this. Maybe we should take the same ideas and do it in other departments. So these are some of these other departments that's starting to work with us. And actually, McKinsey Company also started the model factory with us, and we're actually trying to design next generation learning practice for not only uh, university students, but also for uh, high level managers. We physically built a, a model factories with real physical in infrastructure so, so, so managers can actually experience real life management with, with real uh, uh, workers in, in, the, in, in the training environment. So at the end, I want to say there are some of these people are already our partners in trying to design the program with us, including the leader for the founder of Hackerspaces movement, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mitch Elfman. He proposed to actually have the so-called Hackers in Residence program at Tsinghua University, and so that we can actually have hackers living with us on a daily basis and have students hacking with, with hackers and build something interesting so that becomes a part of our culture. And these are some other interesting uh, organizations, including Creative Commons. I'm a member of this organization. We want to actually teach intellectual rights protocols to students from the get-go. So programmers, uh, engineers, they know what they have created, what is the value for the creation. And these kind of infrastructure ideas, these kind of foundational skills are the future skill set we need to provide to our students, not just math. So actually, I'm thinking about this issue much more uh, different than, than many of you guys were talking about. That is, actually, math is actually a static piece of knowledge. It's actually easy to learn. The challenge is what other things that mo mobilize and motivated you to learn math. And it turns out, for some people it's money, some people it's fame, something is, some people it's social justice. It is these big ideas that motivate people to learn math, so we should actually, to improve math learning, we should improve their way to see the world as a whole, and then use their motivation to drive their learning behavior. So that's my talk, thank you. <laughs>